Hey, what's up guys, it's Technical Tim here, and I want to thank everyone so much who's been liking all my videos and subscribing to the channel, and I really appreciate if you gave this video a thumbs up or subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And I'm going to do a quick recap of UFC Stockholm, and we, um, if you don't follow me all that much on these recap videos, I just kind of go through the whole card generally and give a quick breakdown from a betting perspective and a technique perspective, and I kind of mention what I was thinking before the fight and what I was kind of thinking after the fight. But we had a good day, uh, tracked, I think I risked about seven and a half units and won about three and a half. So about like a 44% ROI or something like that. So good, good start to the month, up three and a half units on the month, tracked, so that was good. Untracked, I was pretty similar. Um, I, I'll i mention as I go what kind of untracked plays I had, but it was mostly live bets that I hit, not pre-fights. Uh, the one untracked play that I hit that I was pre-fight is I hit Tamer fight going over one and a half, and I, I didn't I didn't tip it. Um, I don't always tip all my plays, but I generally do. Sometimes like I'll just notice a line late or even during the card and hit it. So sometimes like I have a few untracked plays. Sometimes they hit, sometimes they don't. Um, but yeah, good event. Solid. Um, but, like, I had some really good reads on a few fights, but I had some bad reads, too. So, I, from a unit perspective, it was really good. From a, a letter grade perspective, I'd give it, like, a C plus, B minus. I wasn't happy with a couple of my plays, but I kind of compensated that with really good plays as well. So, even though from a unit perspective and an ROI, I did really well, you, you need to be objective on your picks, and I don't think I killed it as far as, like, my reads go, but I think I had some good ones, and you have to be objective. First fight, Alvarez Belluardo. Yeah, I mean, I thought Belluardo could win via top position, which he kind of had moments of. I thought Alvarez was probably the more dangerous finisher. Um, I don't know if you could totally predict that out. Like, I think you could have predicted maybe a guard sub, which he was close to, but him just kind of exploding with no technique and getting on top position and getting a wrist lock and pounding him out. I don't know how like you could predict that, but I do think people who were on Alvarez made like a good little read because he did seem to have a good striking advantage. So that one guy who was in my comments, uh, good job cashing on Alvarez. Um, you, you, these just aren't the type of fights that I'm personally good at betting. I talked about that in my final thoughts video. I need like more data against comparable competition. That's where I thrive. So. When I say easy pass, like I mentioned on my final thoughts, it's for passing for me and doesn't mean other people can't win. Um, I, I know my strengths as a better and I know my weaknesses as well. And I tend to just stay away from my weaknesses so my strengths can eventually make me profitable. Um, but yeah, Clark Stosich, I thought I was on Clark here. This is what I think about. I'm going to be fair on this pick. I, I do think Clark was a value, but... I think from a round winning perspective, you could have scored that fight for Stosich, even though this is how I scored it. I thought round one was really close. I tend to think Clark won, but because Stosich had success at the end of round one, judges tend to have recency bias. So I thought they would maybe give him that round, even though I thought Clark had more work in the round as a whole. But so I think it was good judging by not by the judges to not give in to the recency bias because I thought if you, I rewatched that round and I thought Clark won. I could be biased here totally, but I try to be objective. Um, and I, I think Clark won, but you you could you could make an argument for Stosich. And then round two, I thought Stosich won, but I thought Clark was winning the first few minutes by being kind of busier, which I expected him to be. And then Stosich got a takedown. I, and I think it was against the cage, and I think it was more so because Clark got complacent up against the cage and was not... Ex I don't think he thought Stosich could take him down. And I've run into this issue before. I'll be wrestling someone in the room who, like... Like, I, I've gone up against, like, some D2 All-Americans who are, who, are, who are pretty good, and they couldn't take me down. And because whenever I know I'm wrestling a little bit better of a guy, I'm not as complacent, and I'm, I'm not letting them... I'm not willing to let them get in on my hips or anything. Like, my defense is a little more disciplined. But whenever you, like, wrestle with someone who you're like, oh, I, I, could, I could take this guy down a net takedown of 10, 
in like five minutes. Like I'm, I'm like, I don't even have to worry about anything this guy does. So you'll like let them get under your hips sometimes. Cause, Cause you're just like, Oh, I'm fine. Then all of a sudden, like they'll surprise you. And I think an example of that was Alexander Gustafson getting a takedown on John Jones. John Jones is 10 times better of a wrestler than Gustafson, but Gustafson surprised him with a double leg. I think it was a double leg. It was a while ago in 2013, their first fight. And I think it was, and Jones got up right immediately. You could tell like Jones was kind of like, what the fuck? Like, I, I just, he kind of caught me out of position because I wasn't disciplined. And I think that happened a little bit on the takedown with Clark against Stosic. And in round three, he made a good adjustment going for the Kimura to make Stosic bail on the double leg. So great third round adjustment by Clark. Um, but as far as value goes, I think Clark was still value, even though from a round winning perspective, I thought round one was a toss up. Round two was Stosic. And I thought round three was the clearest round of the fight for Clark. He kind of dominated and I talked about in my final thoughts video that I thought Clark would have would win a clear later round and I think that's what kind of gave him the fight because he had one clear round and the other two were like closer even though I thought Stosic won round two but whenever you have one really clear round you tend to get those decisions so um and he doubled the output of Stosic as well so like if they fought like Clark was the better minute winner here, if that makes sense. Like, from a round perspective, Stosic benefited from doing well at the end of round one and two. So he kind of made those rounds, like, an argument for him to win. Because judges, you know, sometimes have a recency bias. And then round three, Clark kind of dominated those five minutes for the most part. So I thought Clark won more minutes because he won a lot of round one. He won, like, half of round two and then all of round three. So it's just like the round by round scoring system can sometimes make things weird. So I still think Clark, like I'd probably cap him like minus 140, minus 150, um, just because of the output battle. And he seems to have a better gas tank. But at the same time, we didn't like get killer value on that pick because I got him around even money. But I think we like made an okay pick. It wasn't negative expected value in my opinion, but I think it was like fine. It was kind of whatever. Um, not a killer pick, not a bad pick. Maleki Santana, <laughs> this is kind of crazy. Um, I didn't pay too much attention here, to be honest. Maleki, I think, got a finish on the ground. Um, good on her. Camacho Hein, this was, this was probably my best pick of the night. Um, I had mentioned that I thought the grappling would mostly cancel out, which it kind of did. Hein got a takedown, but he doesn't put hooks in, like I mentioned on my final thoughts video. And that allowed Camacho to get back up. Um, I have a list in an Excel. You guys are going to think I'm fucking crazy. I have a list in an Excel on people who, A, people who give up their backs, and then another column in the B column, I have a list of people who put hooks in. And I write them down just so I can kind of remember, because if you have someone who gives up their back like Camacho, and then you have a hook player, they're kind of fucked. And honestly, that kind of led to Gustafson's demise tonight, because Smith will put hooks in, and we'll talk about that later. But I have a list of those, and I have Camacho as a guy who gives up his back, but Hein listed as a guy who doesn't put his hooks in. So Camacho was fine there. I wasn't worried about the grappling for him. And then from the striking, he kind of just dominated with output, which I expected. He made an amazing adjustment working his body kick to the body because I, I had mentioned in my final thoughts that Hein was vulnerable to the body, but I thought Camacho would take advantage of it with body punches. Because Camacho, I've seen him throw that body kick, but he tends to kind of throw more hands and brawl. But him deciding to go with the body kick kept him out of punching range to not allow him to brawl as much and just allowed him not to gas himself out. I, I think just like single shot body kicks won't gas you out as much as throwing hands and brawling. So it was just a really measured game plan by him. Um, so it was a good pick, and he throws way more, and that was the main reason I picked him. It's just like an arithmetic fight, like, I, I like to call him. It's like, this fight's going to be mostly standing. Let's take the guy who throws more punches. But I think we benefited, like, he, he was a good, the right pick. Even if he would have ended up brawling, I think he would have been the right pick. But we did benefit a little bit for the fact that his camp made an, an amazing read with that body kick, and we benefited from him not brawling. Um, but even if he would have brawled and not done those two things, I still think he would have been pretty crazy value. So we won that. Um, that was another one we won, that and the Clark. Santos Ray, that was a fucking crazy KO. Um, I know a couple people who played some. 
I, I have a couple buddies who who bet in Vegas and they're really good and they hit Santos heavy and I, I didn't I generally don't I don't really tell um but they hit him heavy heavy like they threw a lot of money on Santos so good on them um cashing and he got all the way down to minus 155 so a lot of money coming in on Ray but I, I just didn't have a really like I kind of just thought this could be maybe a close fight like I, I didn't have I didn't have that strong opinions on it I thought Ray was maybe a decent dog but didn't play it but that was a crazy knock that, that, that like looked weird that knockout like i'm pretty immune to knockouts at this point and i'm sure you guys are too because we watch so many fights like i don't really cringe that often but that knockout <laughs> the fucking rackage manawa knockout like i actually cringed like i usually don't do that i'm i'm kind of like unemotional which is kind of sad um not that i don't care about the fighters well-beings well-being but I thought um, that one like made me kind of turn a little bit inside. Next fight, I had so I had a I tip I I had this tracked a unit and I got Avenger minus one seventy. <laughs> Talk about a fight being wrong on, but uh, yeah. So like, you gotta admit when you fucked up, totally fucked up here. It, this reminded me of the Prezeris fight against the Austrian Wonder Boy. I think that's who it is. Where like the grappling, it was like. Two minus 400 favorites in Avenger and Prezeris, and the grappling just went the opposite direction of what I thought would happen. <laughs> so fights like that just happen, and you just got to be like, fuck it. Um, none of us are oracles. None of us can make all the right picks, and you're just going to you're just gonna miss picks. Like if you have a 1,000 picks over the year, you're going to have some that make you look really, really fucking stupid, and this one made me look really fucking stupid. But... I do think, like, I think what Avenger kind of fucked up on is she should have mixed up her take. Like, I think if she made adjustments, she could win this fight. Like, I'm not saying it was a good pick or anything. I'm just saying she kind of was going for all clinch takedowns. And she was going, like, if you guys know, I mentioned my final thoughts. Landsberg will keep her feet not up against the cage all that often, and it gave the trip opportunities to Evinger. I think she even got a takedown with it. But Landsberg is still strong in that position and can land strikes where Evinger isn't. So if I'm Evinger's coach, I'm wanting her to do open space type of takedowns because that's where you can take advantage of the Muay Thai fighter. Um, they tend to not be good at defending, t as good defending takedowns in open space, but up against the clinch is because they fight with that plum position. They've actually learned grappling in a striking sport. It kind of in that clinch position. So I thought it was stupid for not mixing up takedowns more. That's fine to go for the occasional clinch TD. That's totally fine. But to keep going for it after failing was a terrible adjustment. And she also should have tried to stay higher, use the post hand to adjust her position when she got the back mount on Avenger or on Landsberg. And then she ended up just falling off on top. And one thing I'll admit that I completely overlooked, and if anyone played Landsberg for this reason, you guys made an incredible read, is that Avenger is terrible off her back. Like, she's one of those wrestlers who fuck... She's like a CB Dalloway who dies when they go on their back. And if you kind of made the read that Landsberg can maybe just reverse position once she's on the floor, that she could really pour it on... Um, Avenger, because Avenger just sucks off her back. She can't defend herself. She doesn't fight for underhook. She's going for a Kimura. It's like, as a wrestler, go for the underhook, then grab a single and get back up to your feet. But she doesn't do that. It's just, I didn't expect Landsberg to ever get top position. And if she got top position, I expected her to just stand back up. Um, but, like, if you made that read, great read. Um, totally great read. So, um, I had a little more untracked on Avenger at that minus 170 line, so I lost a little more untracked there. But I had a, I had a few other plays that kind of like compensated for that, which I'll talk about. Achman and Sergey. I played Achman, and I know this is like a low-level fight, and usually I preach this isn't my type of fight, but I thought I saw enough data on both guys to know that Achman was a better wrestler, which I think he was. And I thought he was a little better in the pocket and a little busier in the aggressor. And that kind of played out. But he dropped round two and three. 
because he just got landed on, he got dropped in round two after he kind of won all the other moments in round two. And then in round three, he was kind of winning and then he got stung in the last 10 seconds and that probably cost him the fight. Um, but I thought at plus 150 that I got him at, I just played one unit at plus 150. I thought that was a good play. Like I wasn't mad at that. If you played Sergey at like minus 180, I just don't see the value in that because it was like close on the feet. But the, stri the strikes were, the striking was pretty close, but Ackman tended to be the aggressor in the hometown, and he was the better wrestler, and I expected him to be the better wrestler here. But, like, it was still close. Like, it's still a very competitive fight that Sergey could easily win again. But I, I think if those knockdowns, like, if one of those knockdowns don't, doesn't happen, Ackman takes it. Um, but at the same time, he's chinny, and I, I noted that on my write-up, that Ackman's chinny. And so Sergey just kind of won a couple rounds by getting knockdowns, and I'm, I'm fine with the Ackman play. I'm totally fine there. I fucked up with Avenger, and but on this one, even though I like lost this one too, I don't think I fucked up. Uh, I thought it was like a great value play. I, I would play him again at plus one fifty. Tamer Joe, I hit the over here. I, I kind of just hit this kind. I kind of thought started thinking about it yesterday, and a few people I talked fights with. I think we all hit it, so we all one there and um i also hit tamer live minus 200 after round two because the way i saw it was he was up two rounds and i know he gasses and i was actually looking to play joe after a round or two because i thought tamer would gas but joe wasn't pressuring him or making tamer work so the way i saw it was round three tamer wasn't gassed and, and joe was down a clear two rounds so he needs a finish so Whenever you have Tamer minus 200 where he needs to get finished in round three, that's just fucking stupid. The bookies should have made him like minus four or 500, kind of like they made Giagos after round two being up two rounds because he has to get finished. So I took advantage of that and I, I hit that. So I profited on that fight and a fight that I really didn't think I cared about. But that's the thing about live betting. I, I don't make as much money live betting, but I can get like a few hundred bucks down. Um... So yeah, so that, that kind of helped me with missing that Avenger pick by having more on the Avenger pick. And then I'll talk about another one that I hit. Uh, Giagos Hadzovic, I, I had talked about this fight. Um, I thought Giagos could, was maybe value, and I thought about playing him, but he gasses hard, and I don't like making picks where you have to guess when a fighter's going to gas. But I think, like, theoretically, Giagos was the right play. Uh, that double leg was open, like I kind of expected it to, but I thought he'd maybe gas that, which he kind of started to. 29-27 is weird. I, I didn't see a 10-8 for Giago, so I'd have to rewatch. Rakic Manua. Um, I played really super fucking small on Rakic. I think uh, I think I played him TKO, like super small on track, like just like a five minutes before. Um, nothing big, like nothing that really even made a difference in my night. But I just didn't under, like, it's still, that was a sweet, he, he hit the straight right and then led up with the kick. It's kind of like Donald Cerrone-esque, but I just like didn't, even though the knockout happened quick and we really didn't get to see the fight play out, I just thought Manuel was kind of KO or bust and he doesn't have that distance clearing ability like other fighters kind of do. Like, um, like Clark, I thought that was the main reason he landed on Rakic because he can cover distance because he's a wrestler, but I thought, uh, yeah, um, I, I I didn't understand playing Manoa. A lot of people did. But at the same time, the fight didn't totally play out. Like, I still credit Rakic. It was a fucking amazing knockout. But it kind of just happened quick. But it is what it is. I don't think that was a chin issue for Manoa. I think that head kick knocks out everyone on planet Earth. So, fish gold to Mirakani. I hit a Mirakani. This was like my most confident pre-fight play. And I talked about it, Amir Khani's a better wrestler. He actually, I, I, I have to look at the takedown that he landed, but it, he kind of did like, I don't think it was a single leg, like I had said he would land, but he, I knew he was going to be the better wrestler. It was beyond obvious to me on tape. But Fishgold did better from striking perspective than I thought. I thought even though Fishgold wasn't dominating the striking, I thought he was winning the striking. And then Amir, But Amir Khani's a much better wrestler and grappler compared to Fishgold, then Fishgold is a striker. So I thought Amir Khani was pure value, and Amir Khani was doing the two minute, the, the two minutes left in the round wrestling strategy, where he kind of just keeps it a pretty close fight for a few minutes on the feet, 
and then goes for the takedowns later for recency jo- bias for the judges and to not um, ex- like use a lot of energy early in the rounds, if that makes sense. So like, I think that's the time for like wrestlers to go for takedowns. It should be around that two minute mark because it's in the mind of the judges at the end of the round and just focus on the first three rounds of not letting the other guy get a lot of offense going, which is kind of what Amir Khani did. But I have to look at that at that shot again. I think it was like a multi-directional double leg, which is kind of like a sweep single concept. So he kind of like hit the shot. I was sort of thinking he would, but he was a way better wrestler. And you could tell when Fishgold got Amir Khani's leg up in the air, it, there's levels to this. And I know you've seen Amir Khani kind of like taken down at times before, but that's against Arnold Allen. And Fishgold is taking guys down in Cage Warriors. And, and this was a raw tape fight. You, you had to... If you, if you have a good wrestling eye, sometimes I don't always get the wrestling reads right, but that's where I, I really crush the books, I feel. Uh, those are my type of fights. And Amir Khani, he was the better takedown artist. And I talked about also he's the better high man. He has high man tendencies, and that played out. in this. It played out because Fishgold went for a leg lock, which is a low man tendency that keeps you on your back. And when that happens, Amir Khani starts posting up. So that's, that's one. Um... And in the scrambles, just in general, Amir Khani will post while Fishgold won't. And then another one, Amir Khani went for that second takedown and Fishgold jumped a guillotine. It's another high to low man tactic. Uh, Fish, Fishgold was the low man there. going. He's going for the guillotine and um, Amir Khani does the guillotine defense. I saw it against Arnold Allen and Wilkinson where he'll start fighting hands and he rolls his knees up. He rolls his knees up to his chest. And what he's doing there is he's starting to fight the hands and he's rolling his knees up to keep leverage off the choke. And when you start rolling your knees up and you're kind of on your butt, you are you have like a, a way to kind of then, it's real, I don't know if I'm explaining this correctly, but you have a way to then turn it into your own takedown when you're on your butt because you're not on your back, if that makes sense. So he can, and he always does that. And he turned it into top position himself. He, he went to his back, was on his butt, rolled his knees up, fought hands. And then he does it all the time. Turn it into top position, another high man tendency. And he dominated the scrambles here. He was a better wrestler. And, um, I did think that Darce was possible. I didn't mention it on my final thoughts video, but I saw how he'll go to the front headlock Kind of, and uh, go for that, go for those anaconda darces. I, I forgot if he got a darce or anaconda. I can't remember. Um, but yeah, like he was a better grappler here, and this was like my this was my best read of the night in the sense that I don't think everyone could have made the, those picks. Like there's some fights where people are better than me at, like maybe like a more striking heavy fight. But these gra- these grappling type of fights, like where the top man is the key to the fight, which I thought that was kind of key here. Like Americani won round one because he got top position and he ended up winning round two because he got top position and then got a submission, but he was the high man here. And it was, it was obvious to me on fucking tape. It was so, it was really obvious. And Gugabe had actually mentioned he liked Americani and I was kind of like, Oh, maybe. And then once I taped, I kind of noticed some of that shit. And then I ended up playing him. So uh, that was my best play of the night. Even though Camacho looked like the most obvious favorite, I thought Amir Khani was my best pick because I think that was like... Camacho you could have picked by just looking at the numbers. Like a lot of people could have made that pick. But I think this one, um, you had to have a better grappling understanding to, to be able to pick this correctly. Um, oh yeah, and, and people were like... I think people in the comments were like, Fish Gold's a black belt, bro. Dude, I grappling are my best picks that I and, and Amir Khani's not a black belt. That's what they're saying. Grappling picks are generally the ones that I profit on a lot and in, in wrestling heavy fights. I usually don't know people's belts. I don't give a fuck about belts, and I'm not. I'm not trying to to, to be cocky. It's just I'd rather look at the tape and kind of see how they are as MMA grapplers. That that's what I think is more important. And if you raw tape it the belts are kind of get thrown out the window in my opinion. Um, If I don't, if I haven't seen either person's ground game, I'll default to belts. But if I've seen minutes and minutes and rounds and rounds of a ground game, I don't, 
I don't even know their belt. I don't even know if Amir Khan is a belt. Like, I still don't. Like, I don't, I don't research stuff like that. Like, I will occasionally, but if I, if I see the raw tape of the grappling, I don't give a fuck about what the belts are. I, I've been tapped by blue belts, personally. I've tapped black belts. I've been tapped by brown belts. I've tapped brown belts. Um, there's this one dude who is a black belt, um, and he just, for whatever stylistically, I can't sub him. He can't sub me. So it's like, it, it just, it doesn't always matter on the belts. And, and if you roll a lot, I think you'd know that. Um, and there's different standards per gym on who gets promoted to a belt. Like, I know it might, like, this gym that I used to roll at, um, it was really hard to get promoted to belts. So some of the blue belts would tap traveling brown belts <laughs> that, that came in. So it, you, you don't want to always go by belts. You can default to them. If you haven't, if there's two debutantes and you haven't seen either ground game, you could make an assumption based on their belt. But if you've seen their grappling, try to figure it out on tape. Don't, don't try to default with belts. It's not always going to work. And yeah, sorry about the rant. I just wanted to make that point it, that it, that isn't like a, a condescending thing. I'm not trying to be cocky here. I'm really not. I'm just trying to make a point because I think other people can totally make the same grappling reads I can. Um, and it's not always about the belt. Just kind of focus on the tape. That's all I'm saying. Smith Gustafson. I, uh, I'm, glad, I'm glad I didn't play Gustafson. Um, I, had, I had made a video. I'm going to get some shit talk for this one. I made a video about how Gustafson's a lot busier. And I thought just a striking data would make him win easy in his top game. But the more I taped Smith, I thought Smith's, Smith was a little more dangerous than I had given him credit for whenever I was kind of first taping the fight, if that makes sense. Um, I still thought Gus was going to win. Fine. But Smith fought, like, I'm going to, I've kind of been a critic of Smith. I haven't been impressed by all his performances, but... This was a good performance. I do think Gus kind of fought a bad game plan and is maybe a little bit on the decline, but this was a legit fucking performance by Smith because I was just more impressed on his ability to not get hit as much and shut down the boxing of Gus. I still think Gus was kind of like starting to win that fight a little bit. Um, and he kind of just, and round one and two was kind of a weird feeling out process. Like, I think Smith was edging those rounds, but I think it was because Gus wasn't doing anything. And then Gus, when he kind of started throwing his kicks, his, his, his distance clearing kicks, and started letting his hands go a little more, he was landing. And his one takedown he got was really easy. And then he went for like a weird throw in round three, he got his back taken. And that was the main thing I was worried about, about Gus getting finished is, Smith will take your fucking back and he'll put a body triangle in and make you pay. And we, we've seen Gus, we've seen Gus lose that way to John Jones, but it is John Jones. I think John Jones back mount is frightening with his ground and pound. But I was like, fuck man. I, I kind of saw that. I was like, if Smith gets his back in some kind of weird scenario, maybe he could get a finish. So maybe I'm underestimating his chances of getting a finish. So that's why I ended up staying away. Um, but I still think if Gus adjusted a game plan, he could do better in that fight. But at the same time, Smith, look, Smith looked good. I thought that was his best performance I've seen. He did a lot of good things. Uh, I need to look at the striking totals on that. Like, who was outlanding who? I feel like Smith was doing a lot better from a defensive standpoint. But good on him. Um, but overall, like I said, we... Uh, we did well. We got like a 44% ROI. And so, good start to the month of June. And... We will, next event is UFC Chicago. That's actually in my hometown, guys. So I don't know if I'm going to go or not, but a pe couple people have been like hitting me up online that they want to meet me or something. I'll, uh, I might go to the weigh-in so I could say hi to you there, but just let me know. And I'm excited for that Chicago card. I have a few plays in mind and I'm excited for that one. Really excited for the Korean zombie card too, because I have a lot of action on that one. So have a good one, guys. Thanks.